Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's about time to start. So uh, let's, uh, please let me do a brief uh, entrance and then I'll give some more information and hopefully we will have a nice and fruitful uh, meeting. I hope you, you're all able to hear me and probably I'm not getting any feedback, but it should be okay on my screen. Dear distinguished guests, I would like to welcome you to our webinar on quality assurance of flexible learning, micro-credentials and digital badges on behalf of the Turkish Higher Education Quality Council and also on behalf of our president, Professor Muzaffer Elmas. In recent years, we're all witnessing a fast and drastic transformation in higher education. And learning is getting more and more flexible and leaving the walls of the schools and classrooms, lecture halls, and spreading to every layer of life. So learning now occurs in many different formats in numerous platforms. And individuals are able to obtain different knowledge skills or competencies on countless areas of interest or expertise. And this is exactly where the micro-credentials come into play. A micro-credential is a proof of the learning outcomes that a learner has acquired following a short, transparently assessed learning experience. Also known as nanodegrees, Micro-credentials tend to be narrower in range than traditional diplomas or degrees. And these credentials are awarded upon the completion of short courses or modules. They can be done face-to-face -face or online or in a blended format. And once the learning becomes more mobile and more flexible and also becomes more virtual, mostly obtained from a distance, its certification also should cope with this digital mobility. So this is why digital badges are spreading so fast. And as the market evolves, it is likely that digital badges will become a truly exchangeable form of currency for skills. Today, we will have two distinguished guests who will share their experiences with us. However, before we present them, and listen to their presentations, I was suggested by our team to give an example of micro-credential in health field. Therefore, I will have a short six minute presentation to share with you. As being a physician myself and Dean of the Yeditepe University Medical Faculty, which is located in bi-continental city of Istanbul, I can give several examples of micro-credentials in medical field. For example, as clinicians, we frequently need to update and reskill ourselves to help patients with heart arrest. And so-called advanced cardiac life support can be a perfect example of micro-credential. Uh, as a surprise, we have an electric cut here, but I'm hoping that you're continuing to hear me, correct? So you yes, hear me, anyway, right? Sir. Okay, yes. so, so I just wanted to make sure uh, we have a power cut here. And also as medical scientists, working with laboratory animals is also an important knowledge and competency requirement, which again can be a micro-credential. And biostatistics in medical field also is a good example of micro-credential. And in clinical practice, minimally invasive surgical competencies can be a topic of micro-credential with certification as well. However, to give an example more closely related with education, I will share our unique micro-credential of faculty development program in Yetepe University School of Medicine. So now please let me uh, share my presentation with you. And then once it is up, I will briefly summarize it for you. Okay. Uh, 
Um, did you start seeing my presentation yet? Not yet, sir. No, this is okay. Okay, great, wonderful. We're also getting better and better with these uh, competencies, uh, which is now a part of our faculty program development as well. Now, as I said, there can be several examples of micro-credentials in medical field. However, I will share with you our unique faculty development program in Yetepe University Faculty of Medicine. The first step was development phase, and we performed a SWOT analysis of the Faculty of Medicine. And we obtained students' feedbacks, and we also performed educational needs assessment for our faculty members. We wanted to find out what our faculty needs for their education competencies. And when we determined characteristics of our learners, uh, of our students, and analysis of educational environment for adult education was also important. And uh, just to make sure that uh, I want to clarify, our faculty members of the Department of Medical Education are very competent in accreditation and quality assurance of med medical education. So they conducted the whole program development process. In analysis, it was understood that there was a need for faculty development, especially regarding the following six roles and responsibilities. And these were teaching skills, assessment skills, planning and evaluation skills in teaching, educational program coordination skills, academic counseling skills, and also the sixth one is interpersonal communication skills, as well as professionalism. So the purpose of this radar chart of competence analysis is to, to determine the gap between the required competency levels for the learner academic staff and the current competency levels on the six given roles and responsibilities. So the, uh, here the blue area is the current situation. For example, in the teaching skills of the faculty, it looks pretty satisfactory and reaching the target level. However, in remaining skills, the faculty members need to improve their competencies. In the program, which spreads over nine month period, it had 40 credits or 160 hours, and it has established program goals, several learning assignments, determine credits for every unit under seven modules. And once completed, certification is obtained. And we're also working on assigning a digital badge in the future. So the program, uh, this program curriculum content was determined through a very detailed concept map workshop. And the principles that were watched during designing process are learner-centered learning, experiential learning, and less presentation and more hands-on activities, and both in-class and extracurricular activities, a face-to-face -face and distance education components in a blended learning and reflect reflective sessions. And all instruction materials were created from scratch, uh, such as session plans for trainers, information texts, in the inventories, scales, and surveys, presentation materials, also playing equipment for icebreakers, uh, role play scenarios, pre and post tests, and learning tasks or homeworks. And we also had a blog site. And all materials have been made suitable for distance education as well. And here are some scenes from hands-on small group activities. And active engagement was the rule. And these small group engagements were really very helpful. In face-to-face -face period, the presentations were recorded on an audiovisual presentation editing platform and posted in the blog page for further reviews. 
Now in distance learning, uh, we, all of the materials have been moved to Google Classroom and small group activities are now carried on Google Meet or Zoom rooms. And after COVID-19 pandemic, a new module focusing on distance learning competencies have been added and the faculty development program enriched with this distance education competency module. And here a learner is presenting her presentation on pizza preparation and the moderator as well as classmates are giving their feedbacks on her presentation. So in evaluation, it was made using Kirkpatrick's model and in reaction stage, oral and written feedbacks from participants are obtained. And in Kirkpatrick's learning stage, evaluation of knowledge is done by pre and post tests and evaluation of use of knowledge is done by learning tests. And Kirkpatrick's behavior stage, a qualitative study will be done to understand what kind of behavioral changes the participants acquire through the course. And instructors serial meetings are done to evaluate the program among themselves. So the average evaluation scores of the participants on different program items are seen and the top score is three. And this is an example of written pre and post test, uh, test used in face-to-face -face period. And now once we move to the online platforms, now this is the example of online pre and post test used in distance learning period. Here in the graph, the dark blues being the post test results. And this graph nicely shows the comparison of performance in pre and post tests. And evaluation of learning tasks given to the learners are done on Google Classroom. So by this Yeditepe Medical School Faculty Development Program, we have trained 97 faculty members so far. And it was accepted and presented in Best Practices Symposium. And this program helped re-accreditation of, of our faculty in 2019. And through this program, we observed institutional support for the quality of teaching performance, improvement of teaching quality through academic staff motivation, and also academic staff self-appraisal and effects on their teaching quality. So this is the end of my talk. I'm going to uh, stop my presentation here. And thank you for your patience. And now uh, I would like to present our guest speakers and uh, it will be my honor to present them and have uh, their presentations and listen to their experiences. And at the end of these sessions, we will have question and answer session. And at that time you may be able to use the chat box or you can even uh, type down your questions during the presentation through the chat box. And our first guest speaker is uh, Mr. Douglas Blackstock. It's my honor to present him. And uh, Douglas Blackstock has been the QAA Chief Office Chief Executive since October 2015. And his work includes leading QAA's contribution to the current changes to the policy, regulatory and quality landscape in England and across the UK and the agency's role in developing the teaching excellence framework alongside other sector partners. And Douglas joined QAA in 2002 as Director of Administration and has subsequently held the roles of Director of Resources and Chief Operating Officer and was QAA's Company Secretary from 2002 to 2016. He led QAA number 39's work on student engagement for a number of years and was a member of the NUS and AMP UUK led student charter group and the subsequent framework for partnership group. And he's a board member of the European Association for Quality Assurance in Higher Education, ENQA, and chaired the ENQA staff development group. 
He is a graduate in public administration from what is now Glasgow Caledonian University. So Mr. Blackstock, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it is a pleasure to join you today in one of the two sunny days I think we're going to get in the UK uh, th this month. And unfortunately, I've had to close my blind because it's, it's such a nice day. Um, but it's a great pleasure to be with you. And thanks to Texi for organising this international discussion in such an unprecedented context. A lot has happened in the world since I was able to present uh, with the kind invitation of Professor Musafa at your event in Ankara in January 2020. I never thought it would be so long uh, before I would be able to travel again and I had expected to at least be in Istanbul at the end of last year for the Ankara event. Of course, one of the great things that's happened the last year is Texi got approved as a full member of Ankara following a successful review. So, on behalf of QAA and all my colleagues, congratulations on such a tremendous achievement. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a fundamental impact on approaches to higher education across the world, resulting in a dramatic and rapid move to virtual methods of learning, teaching and assessment. It is hard to overstate the extraordinary effort by the higher education sector across the world that this has represented. It was not only performed quickly and under extreme pressure, but it also accelerated change, bringing forward strategic plans and instigating new ways of working. And quality assurance agencies around the world have needed to review and amend their approaches to meet the sudden changing needs of the sectors that they serve. And we in the Quality Assurance Agency for Higher Education in the UK adapted our own approaches and have worked in partnership with our universities and colleges in the UK and internationally to meet the challenges that COVID-19 has created. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, many of you will know us already, but I guess there will be some colleagues who won't. So just a bit about QAA. We are the UK's independent higher education quality body. We are an independent not-for-profit agency with an independent chair. Professor Simon Gaskell. We remain the only body recognised to assess the standards and quality of UK universities. We have a statutory status as a designated quality body in England, and we are trusted and recognised by governments in all of the four nations of the UK, working in partnership with funding bodies and regulators. It is a complex but an interesting set of arrangements, with higher education operating slightly differently in devolved administrations. We deliver tailored quality approaches for each of their set, this, uh, four sectors, allowing us to share experiences and learn from each other, supported in a UK-wide framework to maintain a coherent system of quality. At the next slide, please. The impact of the pandemic has reinvigorated discussions about micro-credentials and shorter qualifications in the UK. The debate about how, how higher, higher education should be accessed has intensified. The economic impact of COVID is bringing a need to reskill re and retrain many workers, as well as provide students with ways to transfer between vocations as they progress through the career. In the UK, government have been clear that they are interested in lifelong flexible learning, including through the proposed lifelong loan entitlement due by 2025. Across Europe too, ministers have acknowledged the need for swift updating of knowledge, skills and competencies in the decade to come, as outlined in the Rome Ministerial Communique. Micro-credentials are an important part of this, and in December, the European Commission published its final report on a European approach to micro-credentials. But these debates have been going on for nearly 40 years, way back when I was a student in the 1980s. So what has changed in the last few years? Well, in the UK, higher education has become much more diverse, with higher degree apprenticeships, fast track degrees, and more recognition of prior learning. We've also seen the emergence of the big international MOOC providers, edX, FutureLearn, Coursera, Udacity, and others, offering self-paced online short courses. During the pandemic last year, when my 
wife was not able to work in school, she completed four uh, MOOCs to help her in her professional development. And we've seen a growing focus on further education colleges and joining up the tertiary sector to suit local economic and employment needs. There has been a post-18 education review in England in 2018. In Wales, the government commissioned a review of post-compulsory education in 2016, and this has progressed into a new commission for tertiary education and research expected to be introduced in 2023. In Scotland, where the system is more planned, there is already a widespread provision at level four and five, diplomas and certificates between college and university level, and also recognition on the credit framework of smaller qualifications. But a new review from the Scottish Funding Council is calling for more local coherent post-16 provision. So there are a range of approaches, but a trend across the UK towards more joined up, flexible tertiary education. We've also seen the changing world of work. Degrees take investment, not just money, but time and opportunity costs. And this isn't always accessible to workers, especially as technology has disrupted the labour market and people seek to retrain. This is a trend that has accelerated during the pandemic. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who's had to learn how to use Zoom over the last year, although I still struggle with doing the slides and speaking at the same time. The increasing number of flexible learning pathways in higher education and the growing demand for alternative modes of delivery present the sector and its students with a new set of questions, challenges and opportunities. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? So how do we approach quality assurance? Well, at QAA, we've been looking at what's happening internationally and through our partners. In Europe, ENCA are engaged in the Microball micro project, using tools under the Bologna process to explore guaranteeing quality for micro-credentials. The New Zealand Qualifications Authority has a micro-credential system introduced in August 2018. These are five to 40 credits in size, and when a learner has achieved a micro-credential, the provider can report it to the NZQA for inclusion on the learner's record. In Australia, the National Qualifications Framework was reviewed in 2019 with recommendations to adapt it for the future, including short qualifications. This is part of a global trend. I now know that you yourselves underwent significant strengthening of Turkey's National Vocational Qualification System and Qualifications Framework from 2015 to 17. So we have reviewed our higher education credit framework in England last year. The equivalent Scottish and Welsh frameworks were updated in 2015 and 2019 respectively, and include lifelong learning amongst their explicit aims. The English framework needed updating to take account of the changes that I mentioned. And I will post, in the once we get into the discussion, I will post some links up to some articles on the QA website. It was important to define what we mean by micro-credentials though. Often it's a term used to apply to a range of awards, often unregulated, sometimes non-credit bearing, often not assessed in any traditional way. And from our point of view, micro-credentials should be a credit, although we should not normally constitute an award, higher education award in their own right. But what we considered, and this has become a much wider piece of work than just our credit framework review, is how micro-credentials can add up to larger awards. It's important to have qualifications which are agile, local and short, especially in the post-pandemic recovery. We also don't want them to replace with full degrees, but to complement them. But what we want to give is lasting value and explore how they can be lifelong and transferable for students. Each part can build to a larger whole, tailored for every individual learner. The challenge with this is, of course, is how to make these awards coherent. One approach is strengthened regulation. For example, New Zealand's model requires all micro-credentials to be recorded in the NZQA system, as I said, and each learner has a New Zealand record of achievement. The European Commission project has developed a proposed EU standard which would record key information including aims and learning outcomes. Another way is by encouraging consortia of providers to collaborate and recognise each other and we're seeing some of this in different parts of the UK. Next slide please. The possibilities here depend on how adaptable the higher education sector is. There needs to be a close collaboration and agreement between providers and strategic long-term investment to make it work. 
the experience of Australia is you need investment, as I understand it. At QEA, we are funding and supporting some early projects to explore the potential. These include a collaborative cluster project on digital badging, which is part of our enhancement theme approach in Scotland. A collaborative enhancement partnership project on modular learning led by Bath College and involving partners including Bath Spa University, the University of Middlesex, Staffordshire University and Coventry University. And we will be publishing later this week in our Quality Compass series, a report on micro-credentials and the way forward. This is a really exciting area and one, one which has the potential to change the way we do higher education. It can make HE more accessible to more people in the essence democratizing HE around the world, aiding development and boosting employment. There was a recent working paper from UNESCO which suggested that internationally, in many contexts, flexible learning pathways are not yet a national priority for higher education and are lacking targeted measures to facilitate their implementation. So forums like this today are essential to share experiences and learn from each other. And as we look ahead, we keep collaborating with partners and sharing what we learn. And I think the final slide, just to say colleagues, thank you, an enormous privilege to attend this event. I've already heard some new interesting material in our first presentation, and I'm looking forward to learning much more about the approaches that you're developing in the whole of the last 12 to 14 months. My organization has adopted an international approach to know that we can't solve everything in a global pandemic on our own. And we are really keen to learn from higher education experiences around the world. Thank you very much. We thank you very much, Mr. Douglas Blackstock. Uh, we all, I'm sure, put our signatures under all these phrases that you just uh, told us. And we really appreciate your nice talk and presentation. And if you could agree, uh, let's have the presentation or, of our second guest speaker as well. Probably the questions will add up or somehow uh, superimpose, so we can discuss the topic all together at the end. And I will uh, ask our uh, attendees, please write your questions in the chat box. And also you can address the name of the speaker that you would uh, want to direct your questions. And at the end, we will uh, have a nice Q&A session. And now it's my uh, privilege to uh, present our second guest speaker. And uh, Mr. Osman Seçkin Akbiyak is head of the Department of uh, Turkish Qualifications Framework in Vocational Qualifications Authority. And Osman Seçkin Akbiyak has been working for the Vocational Qualifications Authority of Turkey since April, 2010. And he has been carrying out his duty as the head of the unit for Turkish qualifications framework since January 2016. Uh, he has been actively involved in the establishment of the system for recognition of prior learning and Turkish qualifications framework since the very beginning. And he's responsible for coordinating the studies regarding the preparation implementation and management of the Turkish Qualifications Framework, TQF, and referencing to the European Qualifications Framework, EQF. And he has been a member of the TQF Council, which is responsible for the technical studies related to the TQF since March 2016. And he has also been presenting Turkey at the EQF Advisory Group of the European Commission since July 2016. And he coordinated and actively participated in the drafting presentation and negotiation of the Turkish referencing report at the EQF advisory group. And he has a dissertation titled, The Relationships Between the National Qualifications Frameworks and the Education and Labor Market. And Mr. Akbik, the screen is yours, thank you. Uh, you're muted. I guess you have to turn here. Thank you. Uh, dear, uh, now jump. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, warm greetings from Ankara to all participants from all over the world. I can follow from the uh, chat box. People are sending their greetings from different parts of the world. 
uh, thanks for uh, joining the, uh, this uh, beautiful webinar. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank to Turkish Higher Education Quality Council for the invitation and the opportunity. And uh, congratulations uh, to the members of the uh, Higher Education Quality Council for the memberships, membership to uh, ENQA and uh, following memberships to uh, other quality assurance networks in different parts of the world. Uh, when I first heard the term uh, micro-credentials at the EQF conference in Brussels in uh, March 2018, uh, I couldn't imagine to deliver a presentation about quality assurance of micro-credentials in three years during a global pandemic. But uh, this is uh, life and now we are all uh, together. Since then, the term became uh, popular and started to be discussed at both national and EU levels. And we are also discussing the term, uh, we are also discussing the use of micro-credentials in the scope of Turkish qualifications framework, parallel to the discussion at the EQF advisory group. That's why I jumped at the uh, opportunity when the Quality Council invited me. And for a while, I was planning to do some research on micro-credentials and this webinar has been a great opportunity. Today I am going to present the main outcomes of my research. I hope that uh, it would be helpful since the topic is relatively new at uh, national level. Uh, I have to admit that uh, I am not an expert on micro-credentials, but I can humbly share my professional point of view as a colleague of yours who has been working in the qualifications ecosystem for more than a, a decade. Now I would like to start uh, sharing my uh, screen uh, here. Sorry, you can't see, I guess. Now you must be able to see the full uh, screen. Mm, Micro-credentials, including awards, badges, and certificates are not new in our societies. Symbols and badges have been used to mark achievements in many areas, such as military, industry, business, sports, entertainment, and education, uh, as, well as, as well. As the needs uh, of society have changed and globalization and technology developed, these have become uh, more popular. And the growing use of uh, micro-credentials is an outcome of the changing nature of the labor market and of uh, growing uncertainty as to what work will look like in the future. So micro-credentials are par particularly useful uh, in this situation as they allow for tailored, quick and uh, accessible skills uh, development and also uh, redevelopment. There are several emerging uh, developments at EU level uh, regarding the micro-credentials. Already uh, Douglas have mentioned uh, some of them. The first one is uh, the European Commission launched uh, a European approach on uh, micro-credentials as one of the 12 actions of the new skills agenda published on the 1st of July in 2010 in 2020, sorry, and it aims at uh, supporting the quality, transparency, and portability of micro-credentials across the EU. And the Microball uh, project uh, will uh, explore and currently is exploring whether and how the existing Bologna tools can be used or need to be adapted to be fit uh, for micro-credentials. And in addition, the Bologna follow-up group indicates that three working groups tasked with looking at micro-credentials from the perspective of Bologna process. Uh, these are quality about quality assurance, recognition, and qualification frameworks, and ECTS. Another important development is the announcement of a common uh, micro-credential framework by the European MOOC Consortium. And finally, the European Commission is also providing financial support for designing uh, providing and assessing the use of micro-credentials through its Erasmus Plus program. So uh, what are these micro-credentials? Uh, the, um, the, the word credential is uh, very new also for the uh, Turkish um, contacts because we are not uh, very um, used to use this word. We prefer qualification instead of uh, credential. But uh, because of that, uh, we use the 
translation uh, as same as the uh, qualification. So um, these are increasingly seen as a new way of documenting and certifying skills. They are promoted as a way uh, to encourage and facilitate alternative learning pathways that are shorter, more targeted, and more flexible than those offered by traditional education and uh, training. And they are also seen as building blocks for lifelong and life-wide learning, allowing individuals to accumulate learning outcomes over time and across institutions, sectors, and borders. And they also uh, so finally uh, um, provide a way to address the gap between uh, supply and demand for skills in, in, in, a, in a changing labor market. And if you look at the definition, uh, a key issue in the discussion on uh, micro-credentials is to have a clear definition of what they are. And the European Commission is carrying out substantial work on a definition uh, specifically for higher education. And the definition uh, is uh, like this, a, mic a micro-credential is a documented statement awarded by a trusted body to signify that a learner upon assessment has achieved learning outcomes of a small volume of learning against given standards and in compliance with agreed quality assurance principles. This definition is very close to the definition of the uh, term qualification in the EQF uh, recommendation. And here we see that uh, there must be a document, an outcome, and uh, there must be a trusted body, a competent authority. And of course, the learner is in the center of this definition. There must be an uh, assessment, which is uh, quality assured. And uh, um, the learning outcomes should be identified uh, against given standards. And the uh, main difference from the definition of qualification is the terms or phrases, a small volume. It's clear that uh, the micro-credentials are uh, somehow different from the qualifications in terms of their volume. And uh, they express credits volume and they are referenced to national qualifications frameworks and the EQF and they are owned by the learner and they can be shareable and portable in the format of a standalone certificate, a digital badge, or as part of a, a portfolio. So micro-credentials is uh, much more comprehensive than um, badges and um, digital badges. I uh, understand or I uh, think that the uh, term micro-credentials could be used to express all of uh, these short-term or uh, low volume uh, qualifications. And they have some uh, common uh, characteristics, uh, even if uh, there is no agreed definition yet. They are a statement of learning and can be issued in paper or digital format after a face-to-face -face blended or digital uh, mode uh, of delivery, or also recognition of prior learning and uh, experience. And uh, they are not standalone. Uh, they are not recognized as standalone qualifications. However, they have value in their own right as a certificate or recognition of achievement of learning outcomes. They are uh, most of the time, uh, they are quality assured and recognized for further learning and employability. And moreover, they can be stackable. I mean, they can be combined in different forms to obtain uh, a larger credential or a qualification. But there are still several open issues for micro-credentials uh, that relate to a shared understanding. A central one in this dis discussion uh, is the volume of uh, to, uh, to be attributed to the micro-credential. A uh, standardized unit of measure is seen as necessary for the portability, recognition, and stackability of micro-credentials. And short learning courses leading to micro-credentials are gaining ground among learners and employers alike. We see a diversification of providers from schools to higher education institutions, NGOs, private providers, vet providers. And the extent of this offer raises questions on the quality assurance, recognition, transparency, and portability between countries and uh, sectors. I know that this sounds very familiar with the discussions many years ago we had when uh, we, the EQF was uh, being developed or the national qualifications frameworks 
were being uh, developed, it again turns and turns and comes back to the quality assurance. And the full potential of quality of micro credentials uh, has yet to be fully unlocked while rapid progress is being made and in certain areas, uh, notably in higher education, the wider role of micro credentials is less clear. And while uh, technical and digital progress supports the introduction of uh, micro credentials, their quality and value cannot be taken for granted. A lack of transparency is one of the main barriers for seamless recognition of micro credentials and other is trust in them. And to build trust, it is important to have the full transparency over three main characteristics of micro credentials. The first one is the quality of the credential itself. I mean, the uh, envelope, the authenticity and the technology behind it and the learning, ex learning experience, the content, uh, that, uh, the content of the course that leads to micro credential. And the third element is the provider. The trust in the provider of the credential is a crucial element for the trust, uh, for trusting the credential itself, in um, in this regard, I can uh, I can say that I see a very um, similarity as I can see I can uh, see similarities between the micro credentials and uh, crypto money, and uh, crypto money is also uh, very popular nowadays, and uh, people are especially young people and. Uh, people who are open to uh, new uh, experiences are looking for them. And uh, I think the situation is same for the uh, micro-credentials. And because of that, uh, the quality assurance uh, is, uh, and the trust in the uh, product is very essential. And uh, in the higher education sector, this uh, trust and transparency are ensured by quality assurance processes in line with the standards and guidelines for quality assurance in the European higher education area, ESG. I know, I am sure that all of you are very familiar with uh, this um, approach. And the second uh, one is defined by the quality principles listed for all, all sectors in Annex 4 of the EQF recommendation. And these two um, approaches are fully compatible with uh, each other. Sorry. The ESG generally covers the quality assurance of micro credentials issued by higher education institutions. All courses must undergo internal uh, quality assurance by the institution. And in addition to that, uh, either, the, either the course or the institution as a whole is required to undergo extra periodic external quality assurance. And the ESG state that their focus is on the quality assurance related to learning and teaching in higher education, including the learning environment and relevant, relevant links to research and innovation. And they apply to all higher education offered in the European higher education area, regardless of the mode of study or place of delivery. This means that when micro-credentials are part of higher education, they should be covered by quality assurance processes in line with the ESG, regardless of whether they are credit bearing or not. And um, it's key in this regard to distinguish between program-based accreditation and institution-based accreditation. In some higher education systems, institutional accreditation or audit standards already explicitly refer to the micro-credentials, but in other systems, these are not or only implicitly addressed in systems where separate external quality assurance takes place at program level, accreditation mechanisms for non-degree programs or different ways of delivery are not yet adopted by quality assurance agencies and very few quality assurance agencies provide specific accreditation or certification processes for non-degree programs. Those national approaches to external quality assurance, which are based on program accreditation may not be sufficiently responsive to the emerging needs. So national agency regulations may need to be reviewed in order to full, fully cover micro-credentials within existing ESG-based quality assurance systems. The second approach is the uh, quality assurance principles of the EQF and EU transparency tools in the area of qualifications and skills play a key role in the documentation uh, and recognition of micro-credentials within and across borders 
These tools relate to the transparency of qualifications, lifelong learning and career management, and as well as quality assurance and credit systems. In particular, we can say that the EQF can be a reference point for portability in determining the proficiency level of micro-credentials, and it can support a more granular definition of micro-credentials that's, credential that's based on learning outcomes. And uh, the EQF can support the quality assurance of credits linked to micro-credentials. And Annex uh, 4 of the uh, EQF recommendation lists 10 quality principles for all sectors, which should be respected for that sector as well. And I have included five of uh, these 10 principles in my uh, slide. And uh, the, um, uh, the emphasis is on the learning outcomes, the valid and reliable assessment, agreed and transparent learning outcome-based standards, consistent evaluation, consistent evaluation methods, associating self-assessment and external review, and finally, regular review of ex existing external monitoring bodies or agencies. There is a, um, I think there's an important uh, distinction or um, yes, distinction between the ESG and the EQF. Uh, that's this, the EQF uh, focuses on um, lifelong learning. That's why the qualifications can be uh, achieved through uh, formal learning and non-formal and uh, informal learning. Uh, because of that, the concentration is on the uh, assessment more than the uh, provision of education and uh, training. So um, for the, um, the micro-credentials, uh, I think the uh, concentration uh, could be uh, more on the uh, assessment as well, regardless of the uh, place of the uh, learning and the method of uh, learning. And these two uh, standards are uh, fully uh, compatible with uh, each other. And in Turkey, in the uh, scope of um, Turkish qualifications framework, we use very similar quality assurance criteria to uh, EQF. And since the TQF is referenced to the EQF in 2017, uh, our quality assurance systems should uh, be in line with the EQF. And in the future, we are planning uh, to include uh, micro-credentials into the TQF as well. And I assume that the lifelong learning centers established in the higher education institutions and universities in Turkey could be delivering, providing micro-credentials to their uh, learners. And uh, these micro-credentials uh, are uh, very crucial for uh, career development and personal and professional development. And, um, and uh, to include, and it's important for us to include these micro-credentials in the TQF. And uh, in Turkey, we are very familiar with the, uh, with the uh, approach, not the term. The term is rad, uh, re relatively new, I mean, the micro-credentials, but already many of the qualifications in Turkey uh, both in higher education and uh, in VET are unit-based qualifications and uh, the training is uh, provided in modules. So these uh, modules or um, units are very, and courses as well in the uh, formal higher education are very similar to uh, each other. And uh, I think um, we, in Turkey, we are providing micro-credentials but we may not be calling them as micro-credentials, but this is not important. It's, uh, it is just um, a, a method of uh, calling. And finally, I want to talk about the issues to be considered in the um, future to ensure better uh, quality e-learning. And it's important to make sure the quality assurance of micro-credentials are part of internal quality assurance procedures at the universities. In some cases, quality assurance procedures and regulatory frameworks should be adapted to facilitate and monitor the digital provision of uh, micro-credentials. And quality assurance is still largely program-based, although this is moving towards a more institution-centered model. And in case of program-based external quality assurance, it is necessary 
to extend national quality assurance processes and regulations to micro-credentials. And quality assurance agencies can verify these when reviewing uh, them. And in case of institution-centered external quality assurance, micro-credentials are subject to internal quality assurance. And it is the responsibility of the individual higher education institution to adapt their internal process and regula regulations accordingly. And institution-based external quality assurance allows institutions greater freedom to introduce and regulate micro-credentials on their behalf. And national quality assurance agencies should also include micro-credentials in their external review procedures. And finally, uh, there are some concerns about providers with low quality and uh, with low quality learning provision and assessment and fraud. Uh, for this reason, existing criteria and measures for quality assurance must be supplemented according to, to take appropriate uh, account of digitalization in teaching and learning and to ensure security and transparency for all learners groups. At the end of my presentation, I want to share the list of documents that I used uh, during my research. And already Douglas have mentioned uh, some of them. The first three of them are uh, the publications of the commission. And while the last three are, the public, are published by the Microball uh, project, I hope uh, you may find these documents useful uh, as well. I can humbly recommend you to review these uh, documents. Uh, and by this way, we can, um, we can be more successful in Turkey to uh, use the micro-credentials. I hope you may find uh, my presentation uh, helpful as well. I would like to thank you for your patience and for the participants, for international participants and uh, participants from uh, abroad. I would like to welcome you to Turkey as soon as the pandemic uh, is over. Uh, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. We sincerely thank Mr. Uh, Osman Seçkin Akbiyek for this nice and uh, informing presentation and for the uh, references that he used and nicely wrap up the uh, issues that needs to be addressed uh, under these titles. And now we will have a Q and a, a session, but before going into that, Maybe our colleagues uh, would uh, bring up the slide, background slide, reminding us uh, some tasks. And the first one is, I think we will ask you kindly to fill out our short survey. And uh, it's a six question survey as far as I know. So we appreciate your feedbacks about this webinar. And for questions wise, uh, there was a question to uh, Mr. Blackstock at the uh, higher levels of the chat box. I'm going to start with that. And it says, this is from uh, Junaid Akil from Mersin University. And uh, it says, can certain achievement standards be set in order to earn a micro-credential, he asks. Uh, there can be some levels of grades to be earned and etc. So uh, what do you think, Mr. Blackstock? Well, sure. Look, look st I, you start with some of the. I, I mean, and Osman was very clear on the principles of the European standards and guidelines, and the focus on on student centred learning, etc. There has to be learning outcomes that are defined, in my view, uh, and there has to be a process of assessing whether the participant, the student, has achieved them. And and and I say that for two principal reasons. One is the student themselves. Um, and no matter whether there's someone studying part-time because they're in work or an undergraduate is taking something extra, um, it's important that they, they, they, they're receiving credit for achievement. And the second one is public trust, uh, because it's really important that we're just not giving out badges and uh, that are worthless. Uh, so I think if, if we do develop shorter credit-bearing awards, they need to be publicly credible. Right? So, so, so I think I think the question was you just to go three or four courses well that, that that that's that's not achieving credit that's observing that's listening there has to be now the danger is we make it too complicated and build too many uh, uh, barriers and hurdles in um so i think it you know it, it, it, it needs design it needs curriculum design it needs design of the approach to teaching and learning and design to how you would assess it in the same way you would 
with normal practice in an institution that's just a smaller uh, unit. Thank you. Uh, there was a question from uh, Veli Ortecesh asking about uh, should micro credentials be provided by the higher education institutions? I was going to uh, ask for some uh, elaboration on that as well for the speakers. And uh, kindly, uh, Mr. Donald Staub also gave an answer that they have a project in US Embassy in Ankara to provide some uh, micro credentials and digital badges. And uh, I was going to ask. Uh, there was a big variety of these micro credentials, different institutions, different locations. Sometimes uh, certain individuals with certain expertise can give some courses and etc. And how are we gonna gather at this uh, huge variety? And how who is gonna accredit these uh, micro credentials, or what will be the standards for those? How can you wrap up the this kind of a uh, <laughs> you know wide question? Both of you, both speakers, if you could answer. Uh, I mean, Osman, you may have a, a view as well. It seems to me a basic principle. If you have the authority to award degrees, you have authority to award program you know, to, to award credit below degrees. And similarly, if colleges are maybe working in partnership with the university or have an awarding body, I, I think it's really important for public credibility that the body who um, makes the award of the credit has the, the, the right to award credit. Now, that means we go into really interesting territories because we all know that, for instance, in the IT business, there are big companies that deliver really good, credible qualifications. Well, let's think about recognizing different types of institutions, but let's have a process where there is an external um, a, a process of approval uh, so that those are recognized as legitimate qualifications. You know, one of my reasons for stepping back and always go, and, and sometimes I, I guess I may be accused of acting in the self-interest of quality assurance agencies, et cetera, or, or in their own self-interest. We have been battling diploma mills, degree mills, accreditation mills, now essay mills. There is a, there's a global business of academic fraud, and therefore it's important that, we, that, that we, we, we have legitimate and good qualifications rather than fake certificates that uh, anybody can get for listening to a lecture online. Thank you. And so, uh, Akbir, do you have anything to add uh, in relation with the quality framework and you know the standardization of these? Uh, also, there's a question actually directed to you. It's asking, should micro credentials be recorded on the students' transcripts? And uh, probably we will also touch base to the digital badges as well. And our CVs and resumes also uh, turning into a, a virtual or online ones. And, now we are obtaining a collection of these digital certificates and badges and our, uh, our transcripts and CVs will uh, shape up uh, with this transformation uh, kind of additions uh, which we have. So what, uh, regarding the uh, inclusion of uh, micro credentials to uh, transcripts, I have forgotten to mention about the work of European Commission in uh, in, in Europass. Um, the uh, the work is aligned to micro credentials initiative, and uh, it facilitates the issuing and storage of all forms of learning achievements, including micro credentials, in a digital format. Work is ongoing uh, on the development of Europass digital credentials infrastructure, and this will support authentication services for any digital documents or representations of information on skills and qualifications, as it's outlined in Europass decision. As a digital file, these credentials can include a wide range of valuable information that can help the recognition and understanding of the credential by employers and other institutions. I think in very near future, people may not uh, have to print out their uh, diploma certificates or transcripts. Rather, uh, they will uh, just share maybe a, a password or a QR code with the uh, institution they apply for a job or the institution they apply for further learning. And the institution will be able to see all the certificates, all the badges, all the learning achievements that the uh, person uh, has uh, accomplished. And regarding the uh, other question about the um, 
that I think it was about the setting standards, some quality standards for uh, micro credentials from uh, the framework perspective, a micro credential is a kind of qualification uh, simply. And all qualifications uh, could be uh, quality assured. And uh, this is very, this is not very complicated. Uh, the uh, I, the um, word accreditation even may not be mentioned because uh, the accreditation is the, I uh, see as the uh, top of Everest, you know, the, um, the best that you can do. But uh, in, the, in terms of uh, quality assurance in the frameworks, uh, we don't uh, talk about the maximum. We always talk about the minimum. And uh, because, uh, because of that, the uh, minimum uh, self-assessment and external evaluation of the uh, qualification of the credential uh, is enough uh, to ask the uh, credential. And a few days ago, I have a totally um, accidentally, I have seen that the, I have uh, learned that the Ankara University is recognizing the uh, badges, digital badges provided uh, after Coursera courses in the uh, bachelor programs. Uh, and uh, they uh, give credits for the, uh, not compulsory courses, but optional courses that are out of the field. But in the future, uh, this may also be applied for, the, uh, for all courses in the uh, higher education sector. Let's think about a student who has uh, taken a course uh, in, the, in, the, in maths and uh, he or she can provide the uh, outcome of the course and may apply to the uh, university for the recognition of this uh, short-term course uh, instead of uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, a three cred ECTS credits course in the um, formal face-to-face uh, -face learning. And finally, I want to uh, add uh, one small uh, point. Uh, I think uh, we have to understand that we are uh, in a new century. We are talking about Generation Z and students are and people are looking for things faster and shorter and tailor-made. And because of that, they can't, they can't even stand uh, video to watch videos longer than two minutes. And because of that, it is better it is shorter. Because of that, I think all uh, education providers must bear this in mind. And if we go back to the question coming from the uh, Minister of National Education, of course, they can provide micro-credentials in public education uh, centers. And even the courses they are providing, some courses they are providing in the public education centers could already be micro-credentials. I mean, they don't need to be uh, in a different format, they don't need to be digitalized all the time. We are talking about digitalization to, uh, to uh, ease the process, the delivery of the provision, but micro-credentials can be provided face-to-face, -face, online, or blended uh, format. It's possible. I think in this kind of, in this world, everything is possible, I think. Nothing impossible. Okay, thank you. Uh, Douglas, could you comment on an issue? There's a uh, striking difference between a diploma program and micro-credentials. In micro-credentials, uh, there have been potential to be followed by an extensively variable group of learners uh, with different age, different expertise, academic performance level, or you know, different backgrounds. How would this affect the learner group dynamics and quality assurance of these you know, learning pathways, these micro-credentials. Sure, um, I, I, I, I, I'm going to use an example. It's a level three diploma. So, you know, a, a degree is level six in, in, in, well, six in England, it's slightly different in Scotland. But we run a program called Access to Higher Education Diploma. And over 20,000 students complete it every year and go into higher education. It's designed for students who left school with little or no qualifications. So from the very beginning of the program design, it's about people who've been out of learning, maybe haven't achieved the school, but to help them change their lives is genuinely life-changing. We, we, for many of um, the, the students come on that, 
are, are people who left the armed services, who've maybe gone straight from school into the, the military and, and, and or, or, or into other public services. So that's one aspect. But just to pick up on, on, on the previous point, we have to be rethinking what we can do here. And, and so we've got qualifications frameworks. We've got ECTS and credit transfer and whatever in our institutions. We, what we're trying to grapple with is sub-degree qualifications in smaller units at different levels, whether it's level four, level five, level six for us. And how do you design them in a way that they're credible, or worthy, student-focused, um, help the student to, to learn and retrain and move on, and might be able to be built up to get to a complete higher level award. So just thinking outside of what we've always done with creative new ways. And I see there was a question about who can deliver. I'm agnostic about who can deliver these things as long as it's a well-designed program with qualified staff who can, and, and, and there's proper assessment. So that could be private providers, it could be universities, it could be tertiary colleges, it can be online. Uh, we, we, we, you know, there is a real challenge. One of the reasons this is all coming up there are economic needs. There is, there is, you know, the development of artificial intelligence. There are jobs disappearing and new jobs coming. But there is a limit on how much government can invest in education and in higher education. So increasingly, the private sector is opening up and filling spaces. Charities are opening up. Uh, we've even got a cooperative trying to develop a university in the UK. So I, I think we, we just have to be really different and flexible and rethink what we're doing. It won't come right away. It will take a bit of time. Uh, we need to work it through. We need the policy incentives. Uh, we need the, the, the recognition uh, processes and approaches. And, and I think that, you know, that, that, that, that it's, it's, about, it's about being creative and innovative and in supporting the transformation. So when it comes to go back to the core of your question, yes, we will have different types of learners. So think at the design stage. We're going to have different people at different stages with different experiences. How do we design something that's engaging, creative, involves them, and, and it can help them learn at their pace? So I, I, the point that was made there about videos, over the, during the pandemic, we have picked up a trend across the UK we're hearing. And I saw it at Christmas with my kids. They're re-watching their lectures two and three times at 1.7 and 2.0 speed. As the, that's the revision. And so there are lots of new ways that students want to learn and be engaged. And I think we can, we, we, we can move outside of the way we've always done things. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Arpik, uh, Mr. Blackstock nicely actually uh, explained uh, the different levels of programs and uh, preparing the uh, people maybe dropped off to school before and trying to go back to certain education, et cetera, and also address the, how to address the differences between the learner levels and et cetera. And there's a question here from Don Barrett and it says uh, she's interested in uh, micro-credentials. Can they be incorporated on the national qualifications framework? And this is somehow related to different levels of education and also maybe recognition of the prior learnings as well. Uh, are there specific ways or are there specific rules or guidelines that uh, how should we uh, recognize these learnings and uh, incorporate them into the uh, national qualifications framework? Yes, indeed. Uh, already Douglas uh, had mentioned in uh, some level uh, about the inclusion of uh, micro-credentials in the New Zealand uh, qualifications framework, and it is the case for uh, Australian qualifications uh, framework also, and uh, we can easily see that uh, this, is a, um, this is a phenomenon uh, coming from the Anglo-Saxon uh, countries. And the guy who first mentioned micro-credentials in the uh, conference in Brussels in 2018, he was also a, a high-level representative from the New Zealand Qualifications Authority. And uh, I can say that the micro-credentials uh, are clearly being included in the national uh, frameworks, and they are also referenced to the EQF. As long as they can, they meet the quality standards, quality specifications. As long as they are uh, defined in learning outcomes, and uh, they are uh, trusted by the users and the uh, beneficiaries of the uh, of them, 
and um, it's it is no difference uh, from the inclusion of uh, qualifications and micro credential as i said is a kind of qualification and uh, if uh, qualifications are uh, included in the uh, frameworks and micro credentials can be easily uh, included uh, but the providers of these uh, credentials should uh, be quality uh, assured and this is more uh, practical or more possible for higher education institutions and minister of education and uh, formal uh, providers of uh, qualifications but this is not impossible for uh, private providers uh, as well we we know that in many countries and in uh, uk as well many private uh, providers have succeeded to include register their qualifications or micro uh, credentials into the um, frameworks and the difference about the difference between micro credentials and uh, higher education programs i can say that the higher education programs could be ma macro credentials mm -hmm. they are much more bigger in terms of volume sometimes they are 180 ects 240 ects and uh, they are very uh, general uh, but micro credentials as one of our uh, participants has written in the chat box, are very uh, specific, very tailor-made, and uh, sometimes they are um, designed for special purposes. And uh, because of that, uh, they are different from uh, higher education uh, qualifications, but I want to underline again, they are a kind of qualification at the end of the day. Thank you. Actually, there are several questions, some related, some not, and uh, it's kind of difficult to follow all and answer all those, but probably you may also use chat box sometimes to address some questions, but I'm uh, wondering something, uh, Mr. you're also a member of Turkish Vocational Qualifications Authority. So we are talking about the new ways of transferring knowledge to people, uh, the new ways of uh, you know, teaching and learning, and what are the expectations of labor market? Now, uh, do you think uh, the job advertisements will change or maybe they already started to change? Are they gonna ever look for a certain diploma or are they going to ask for a certain list of qualifications and certain you know, digital badges and et cetera? And are we uh, as higher education community, let's say, able to uh, satisfy the needs or expectations of the labor market with our graduates? That's a good question. <laughs> in Turkey, we are familiar that um, in the higher education um, sector is uh, very welcome to try to satisfy or only focus to satisfy the uh, needs of the labor market, but this is unavoidable. I mean, yes, academic um, education is also uh, important, doing research and uh, transferring uh, general knowledge to the students, but the labor market is also looking for up-to-date skills. And um, to ensure this, micro-credentials or short-term courses are uh, very beneficial to the uh, learners. I don't, I, yes, we have started to see the change in the advertisements, rather instead of uh, including a long list, the uh, employers may look for specific qualifications uh, in the higher education uh, sector or in uh, lifelong learning uh, sector. Uh, and uh, not, uh, the, uh, not an adver adver advertisement, but uh, in the, um, let's say, uh, in the, um, in the sahibinden.com, you know, and or Hurriyet Emlak, uh, there are, uh, people are trying to sell their uh, flats or their houses, and also there are uh, brokers, professionals in this field, and we now see that they are indicated that uh, they are indicating that they have uh, a qualification uh, from vocational qualifications authority in the field of um, um, brokerage, and um, uh, they are um, they are uh, they think that they have a privilege from other uh, people uh, assisting in this uh, transaction, this transaction, and 
And, and in the future, I believe that we will see this uh, type of uh, examples as a vocational qualifications authority. Uh, yes, I am a, a employee of the um, authority and the authorities providing uh, very special purpose vocational qualifications uh, in line with the needs and expectations of the uh, labor market stakeholders. And already these qualifications are developed by the uh, labor market actors themselves. So uh, many of them are uh, very special uh, purpose, very focused and uh, up-to-date uh, qualifications. But the uh, education provision is lacking because the authority and the institutions that the authority uh, accredits, let's say, do not uh, have the authority to provide the education. This may sound very uh, interesting or weird to international participants, but this is the case. What the authority is doing is uh, validating the prior learning. Uh, the uh, certification bodies are only carrying out assessment and evaluation, and they are not providing education. The education is provided by the labor market actors at workplace, by Minister of Education in public education sectors and the vocational education sectors, and even by the higher education institutions. Uh, so because of that, um, the institution so there must be a, a, very a very strong relationship between the education providers and the certification bodies, the awarding bodies. This is very crucial. And personally, I have been insisting on this for many years that uh, higher education institutions and awarding bodies and uh, education centers, education institutions must have very uh, strong collaboration in order to fully satisfy the needs of the both society and the labor market. Thank you. Uh, we are really in excess of our time. It, there are several questions. It's a very uh, interesting topic attracting a lot of attention, uh, but uh, probably we will need to uh, wrap up. Uh, I wonder if Mr. Blackstock and yourself has certain uh, uh, things that you need to add before we close, but I will start, uh, I will kindly ask our uh, attendees again to fill out our survey be before uh, leaving the word for, uh, for you for saying the last uh, additions, let's say. Mr. Blackstar. Sure. What, one of the things I find in conversations, even within colleagues in my own office, not that I've been in an office for over a year, is that people talk of micro-credentials and they're not always meaning the same thing. And so there is some need for clarity about what do we mean? So is a micro-credential someone uh, doing a, a three-hour course and they get a, a badge or a certificate? Well, that's a training session. Or is it someone doing maybe six, eight, ten credits for something that is a useful unit to help them at employment? Or is it um, a 30-credit, a 40-credit program over a few months that you could then do five or six or all of those and build up to a full degree if you wanted over time. One of the things that we've been talking about is, so we, you know, we have a bachelor's degree. Below that, you can, after one year, you could have a certificate in higher education, then you could have a diploma in higher education. The general view is that they are exit qualifications for people who dropped out, who maybe couldn't complete a degree. My chairman always says, he, he worked in the US, and you would often see job applications from someone saying, I completed 30 credits at this institution. I've achieved 60 credits at this institution. And instead of seeing shorter courses or shorter programs with a smaller amount of credit as someone who has not completed the degree, let's celebrate the success of someone who's achieving, moving forward in their life and their career, and may possibly build up to a full degree over time. So I think what I'm really saying here is, it's time for us to be more imaginative, more creative, support learning, support lifelong learning, support progression in, in education and in careers, and help prepare ourselves and our people and our populations for a changing world where, you know, you, you remember 10 years ago, I was going to the presentations at the school for my kids as they were leaving school before they went to university. And the teachers were saying, you'll probably do three careers that aren't invented yet. That process is accelerating. 
So this is a way of higher education staying plugged in to support the economy, support education, support their graduates, support the students and, and academic staff are well placed to deliver and support that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that was a lovely discussion, a great presentations and great audience. I really appreciate that. Now we're finalizing our second webinar of Turkish Higher Education Quality Council on flexible learning with focus on micro-credentials and digital badges. No. And I, want to, I want to thank all of my colleagues in Turkish Higher Education Quality Council for their invaluable support in the planning and realization of this webinar. And we once again thank to our guest speakers and all of the attendees for joining us and for their valuable contributions. And until our next webinar, please stay safe and we wish you health and happiness. And thank you very much for joining us. Bye now. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Bye bye. Hoşça kalın. İyi akşamlar. Hoşça kalın. Teşekkürler. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.